Assalamu alaikum viewers. It is a great pleasure and honor to have with us today a renowned mathematician, Professor Graham Higman. Professor Graham Higman is a fellow of Royal Society. He was a Wayne Fleet professor at Oxford for over 30 years. He was also president of the London Mathematical Society and the founding editor of the Journal of Algebra. He has been decorated with the Morgan Medal and Berwick Prize for his celebrated work in group theory. After his retirement from Oxford, he has traveled to USA, Australia, Singapore, and recently has visited Pakistan. Now, Professor Hickman, would you like to tell us how you became interested in group theory? Yes, certainly. Um, of course, I first became interested in mathematics in general when I was at school simply in the way that most school children choose a subject, it happened to be the subject that I was best at. When I was an undergraduate, um, I was w interested in several branches of mathematics. When I became a research student under Henry Whitehead, who was of course a topologist, he put me onto a problem in group theory with the intention that it should be applied later on in topology. And uh, I got as far as the group theory, but I got stuck there. So in a way, you could say that I'm a failed topologist, if you like, and that's really why I'm a group theorist. But, uh, of course, as a group theorist yourself, you probably don't want to see it in those terms. Yes. And uh, what do you think the study of... Uh, why do you think that the study of group theory is important? Well, of course, in the first place, um, like many other research mathematicians, I do what I do not only because I think it's important, but also because I think it's interesting. The problems that one has to deal with in group theory are challenging, they're intellectually difficult, and when one has got into a problem, it's not so much the question of how... Um, how much it has an application to the real world that concerns you. It's a question of exercising your mind, exercising the control that the mind has over the things that it understands. Of course, it is true that group theory has applications in the sciences. Perhaps we should say, for the benefit of most of the people who are likely to be listening to us and who have no idea what group theory is, that group theory is, in fact, the study of symmetry. What a group theorist is concerned with is the possible amounts of symmetry that an object can have. Symmetry in the abstract is our study. And because everything has some degree of symmetry, and because a physical scientist, for instance, who is studying a problem finds it easier to deal with if he takes the symmetry into account. He needs to know what kinds of symmetry there are, and he therefore needs to know the results of group theory. And it is in that way that group theory acts as a, a servant to other sciences, as well as being a subject in its own right, an, interest, an interesting subject in its own right. That's the question, actually, uh, which normally we are faced, and the, the students normally would like to know what direct applications group theory has in uh, some of the basic sciences? Well, if you want to know the direct applications it has, you have really to ask the scientists. You have to ask the physicists. Um, a great many of the recent developments in group theory, in particular in the representation theory of certain groups, have been carried out not by people who regard themselves as mathematicians in the first place, but by people who regard themselves as physicists. They do them not because they're interested in mathematics for its own sake, but because it makes the work of the physicist easier. And if your students ask you that sort of question, you point them to that kind of answer. Right. In some countries, set theory is introduced to students at an early stage. What do you think about this? Set theory? Yes. What exactly do you mean here by an early stage? I mean, well, actually, uh, like in Pakistan, set theory is uh, introduced at a very uh, early stage, like uh, a student of uh, class three or uh, four. What is class three or four? That's, are you uh, talking, what age are you talking yes, about? Uh, 
our students normally they go to schools at age five. I so see. So when you're I say about schools, yes. yes. So it means about nine years old or something. Yes. Yes. This is a, there's a sort of slight language difficulty here, isn't there? Because I think when, I, when you say student, I think of university students. No, no. But you're talking about schools. It's very early stage that I mean. Yes. Um, but I think the answer to the question about set theory depends how much you try and do, and in the spirit in which you try and do it. I mean, set theory is a perfectly natural language for talking about um, things that occur in everyday life. And provided you don't try and develop it in a very abstract and arid sort of way, I think children enjoy it. And anything that children enjoy, they should be taught, really, within reason. And if they can be taught to enjoy their mathematics, they will, they're much more likely to take it up. Well, our students and teachers, they think that uh, set theory that we teach in those classes is quite abstract and it's very axiomatic actually and uh, when the students they don't see any direct application of that then they find it very uh, yes, abstract. And, yes, you know, this, this is natural but, um, <clears throat> but there are plenty of examples that you can give to show that, it's, um, that it is a useful language, I think. I think if you try to, to teach it as an axiomatic science then, then you will not get any response from children because the the power and the attraction of an axiomatically developed subject is something that comes to students later in life. I mean, to university students, this can very often be an interesting and exciting thing. But yes. the younger a child is, the more concrete his or her mind is, and therefore you have to begin with the concrete things. We don't begin with the axiomatics, we begin with the practical situations which we axiomatize later when we want to form a theoretical subject. I remember the most uh, confusing thing for students is the definition of set, actually, because it indeed is not well defined as such, is it? Well, you know what a set is without having to define it. I mean, and, uh, just as you know what all sorts of things are without having to define it. I mean, you don't... Um, the, the passion for exact definitions is another thing that comes later in life. I mean, the, the mathematician the developing mathematician, the undergraduate, knows that he has to have exact definitions if he's going to get exact proofs. But of course, you don't begin that way. That, that, that's a level of abstraction that you reach later on, and you reach it because it's necessary to the subject. It makes the subject powerful when you get to it, but if you try and introduce it into the mind of a child too soon, then the child just curls up and runs away. Yes. So it's not a good thing. Let me ask you then, uh, in Britain, at what level uh, do you teach? Uh, Quite honestly, I don't know. I mean, um, I'm not a school teacher, and my children have been yes, past that level for some time, so I, I, I really don't know. Okay. I, it's, it's... Uh, well, and then we come to the next question. In my opinion, advancement and perfection of mathematics are intimately connected with the progress and prosperity of the state. Now, uh, do you think that a country can progress without giving due respect to the fundamental research in mathematics? Oh, well, that's a question, isn't it, um, that you're asking me to, um, to go out on a limb about. Well, it, you really do have to ask what you mean by progress a little bit, what, what, what you're aiming at. I mean, perfectly obviously, if you're living in a country which is blessed with a, a fertile soil and a comfortable climate, you can live without any intellectual life at all. The, the intellectual life is, uh, is not in a way necessary to human existence. Uh, you may feel that it would be an unsatisfactory life in many ways. You may feel that it would be a limited life. And if you happen to live in a country which doesn't have those benefits, you may feel that uh, you need it for, for various things. But, um, but you can't give a general and sat entirely satisfactory answer to a question like that. We have to face the fact that we don't do mathematics solely or even primarily because it's of economic benefit. We do it primarily because it is, as one French mathematician told another, the glory of the human mind that is involved. And... Um, if we're not prepared to do mathematics or other exact sciences for the glory of the human mind, we almost certainly won't do them at all. Uh, the fact that they have economic uh, 
benefits as consequences is incidental. There is a school of thought which believes that uh, instead of developing your own fundamental sciences, uh, why not to acquire technical know-how from the developed countries and use them rather than developing your own fundamental sciences and reaching to that point where you start producing uh, well, I mean, I think, uh, I think this argument has more force if you're talking about technology than if you're talking about fundamental science. I mean, if you're talking about technology, of course, it's, it's important to consider the time factor. If you're insisting on developing your own technology, that's going to take you a long time, whereas if you acquire technology from somewhere else, you can use it right away. But... Um, as far as fundamental research goes, I think the, ca the case is different. I mean, you do fundamental re research not in order to acquire the results solely, but because, as I say, the process is, is an ennobling one. It's, it's one which makes you more worthwhile than you were before. And it's, it's something, if you cut yourself off from all that, you're making yourself uh, less human than you ought to be, or so it seems to me. And I think we have to take that line. Now, uh, you have been in Pakistan for five days yes. or so, and uh, do you find Pakistan any different from the picture that you had in mind before uh, you arrived here? It's always hard when you come to a new country and you wait there for about five days to remember what you thought it was going to be like before you got there, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think, trying to remember. I don't think really that I do find it very different. I, I, I do remember when I first came here, knowing that it was at the end of a, uh, of a hot, dry summer and that um, the monsoon hadn't yet broken. I was a little surprised to find how green the place was, and I was a little surprised to find how near to the mountains Islamabad was. But these are sort of small things, aren't they? Uh, I would also say that... Um, concerning the workshop in algebra that we've just been through, that I was pleasantly surprised by the enthusiasm and the standard of knowledge of the participants. It, it went very well, and uh, I, uh, apart from those two things, I'm not sure that there's anything that I would want to say that surprised me about Pakistan. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Hickman, for giving us time, and uh, thank you, you viewers also. Khuda Hafiz.